OK, we're now going to move on to look at the different theories linked to how criminality comes about. And we're going to start by looking at biological theories. Now, I've broken up each PowerPoint into each individual specific theory for biological theories. And at the same time, what I'm going to do, I'm going to incorporate two other assessment components, AC 3.2, which is evaluating the effectiveness of the theory, and then AC 4.1, which looks at how the theory informs policy development. So the first set of theories we're going to look at are biological theories. So AC 2.1 is concerned with biological theories, and we're going to start with a subsection of biological theories, which are physiological theories, and we're going to look today at the work of Cesare Lombroso. So we're looking at biological theories. So it's about the biology, the makeup of the person and the subcategory is physiological. So biological theories basically state that criminals um, are biologically difficult, are different from non-criminals. And it's this difference that causes them to commit crime. As I said previously, there's a number of different biological theories and explanations for criminology, uh, criminality, but we're going to look particularly at a physiological theory, that of Cesare Lombroso. A reminder, when you see the word physiological, physiological is to do with your physique, how you look. So physiological theories claim that the physical features of criminals differ from non-criminals. So let's have a look at Cesare Lombroso. He was um, between the years 1835 and 1909. He's known as the father of modern criminology. There he is, impressive looking man. And he was an Italian psychiatrist and military doctor who was the first person who really pioneered the use of scientific methods in criminology. And that's what makes him so significant. In reality, his theory is very much now not considered to be of um, any real weight whatsoever. But it's the fact that he was the first to look for a scientific method to explain why people were criminal. So here are his key ideas. He believed that criminality was inherited, that people were born criminal. He believed that offenders were basically throwbacks to an earlier phase of human history. They were some way not as developed as other human beings. And he believed that criminals could be identified by their physical attributes, the way they looked. And these were known as atavistic features. You absolutely have to know that phrase. So atavism, atavistic features, technical language in the exam, please. So make sure you learn that word linked to Lombroso. And his theory that people were born criminal came from data he collected from 383 post-mortems of criminals and also his examination of the facial and cranial, so the shape of the head, features of 3,839 criminals who were still alive. So quite a bit of data there. So he looked at um, autopsies of criminals and also measured the facial features of 3,839 criminals who were still alive. And these are some of the um, drawings from his book, so you can see what he was thinking. And his conclusions from this research were that 40% of criminal acts could be accounted for by atavistic characteristics. 40% of all the crime that was committed uh, could be accounted for by the way that people looked, the shape of their faces, the shape of their head, etc., etc. So as I said before, atavistic relating to something ancient, ancestral, primeval, um, the idea that these people were not uh, fully developed human beings um, in terms of um, how they've developed over time. So his key ideas, as I said, he argued that criminals were physically different from non-criminals. And basically what he tried to do is relate certain physical characteristics to sociopathic and criminal behaviour. So he regards the criminal as basically a separate species, a species that's somewhere between modern and primitive human beings. 
you've got these atavistic primitive features. So those who commit crimes have atavistic primitive features. They're throwbacks from the earlier stage of human development. And this manifests in their tendency to commit crimes. So this idea that one is born criminal is the idea that your criminal tendency is inherited. So therefore, the criminal has no control over their behaviour. It's biological, it's part and parcel of what they are. So what Lombroso is arguing that is that the born criminal can be determined by the physical shape of the head, the face, the jawline. He's looked at the dimensions of the skull, etc. And he's trying to identify those features that make someone atavistic and criminal. So he believes that criminals are pre-social, they're unable to control their impulses, they have a reduced sensitivity to pain. And one of the interesting things he said was uh, that's why he believed lots of uh, criminals had tattoos because they didn't feel the pain of being tattooed. So that was the decreased sensitivity to pain manifested itself in the fact that they were tattooed. So let's look at these atavistic features in more detail. So Lombroso identified them as having a low sloping forehead, so more like a Neanderthal type human being, large ears, uh, asymmetry of the face, a protruding jawline, long arms, asymmetry of the cranium, a large chin, and a flattened or upturned nose, coupled with high cheekbones. And what Lombroso concluded was that males need five or more of these characteristics in order for them to be prone to criminality, whereas females only needed three to be in that danger zone of having been born criminal. So, according to Lombroso, you can tell what kind of crime someone will commit by the way they look. Now, my advice to you would be have a couple of examples of these so you can use them in an exam question if you get something on Lombroso. So, Lombroso be, believed that a thief could be identified by their expressive face and small wandering eyes, that murderers had cold, glassy stares bloodshot eyes and big hawk-like noses, and that sex offenders had thick lips and protruding ears. And in addition to these physical traits, Lombroso suggested that there were other aspects of the born criminal, and these included less, as I said before with the tattoos, less sensibility to pain and touch, more acute sight, a lack of moral sense, including an absence of remorse, so they didn't feel regret for their crimes. They were more vain, they were more impulsive, and they were vindictive and cruel. And as I said before, um, other manifestations also included use of special criminal language and, as I said before, excessive use of tattoos. Lombroso also, just as a an extra to this, went on to identify two other types of criminals that he saw as biologically different, and he referred to these as insane criminals and epileptic criminals. But really what we're looking at more is his atavistic features in this section of the course. So that's Lombroso's theory. Now, as I said before, really not a lot of credence is given to this theory anymore, but you still need to be aware of some of the pros and cons. So if you get an evaluation question on Lombroso, know the strengths, know the weaknesses. So let's look at these. So there's not masses of strengths, but let's look at these in detail. So as I said before, Lombroso is the first person to study crime scientifically. So he's using objective methods to gather evidence. Before Lombroso came on the scene, crime was just seen as a moral or religious is issue. He's the first person to look scientifically at the causes of crime. So that is why he's known as the father of criminology. The fact that his theory is not given any real credence, any weight whatsoever, is 
not the important thing. It's the important thing that he set the ball rolling in looking at other causes of crime other than the moral or the religious. And he did, his research did show the importance of looking at clinical and historical records of uh, records of criminals, which links through to offender profiling and that sort of stuff that we use nowadays. Um, his later work, it would be true to say, did take on some limited account of social and environmental factors, not just heredity, um, the biological ways. So there's a little more credence there. And by arguing that offenders weren't freely choosing to commit crime, he helps us to focus on how we might prevent further offending rather than just simply punishing offenders. So he's challenging the idea that criminals are evil or that they choose to be criminal. So that's important in terms of how we understand criminality. He also was very accurate in that he labelled prisons criminal universities and suggested that prisoners came out much worse than they went in. Now, there's a lot of truth in that. Given today's recidivism rates, rates of reoffending, that's actually a very perceptive thing to think, Lombroso, because you're spot on there. So um, he was right in that aspect of his thinking. And of course, his work, in a sense, as I said previously, heralds the beginnings of things like offender profiling, get a big, getting a bigger picture of the criminal. So his strengths really lie in what came after him, the way that he set the ball rolling. What are the weaknesses? Well, you've probably picked up quite a few of these as we've gone through the um, theory. So weaknesses, well, first of all, even though he looked at um, over 3,000 uh, inmates and over 300 um, autops, um, autopsies, he didn't have a control group. So therefore, in any sense of the word research, his research is invalid because there's no control group there whatsoever. Um, all research since Lombroso has really failed to show a link between facial features and criminality. So there's no proof whatsoever that his theory is correct. Um, I think you could also argue that, well, not can argue, it's a very good argument, by describing criminals as like primitive savages, He's actually equating non-Western societies with criminals. So that's a form of racism. He's actually putting the atavistic features on um, non-Western societies. So it is racist in its very nature. And of course, the key thing is that not everyone with atavistic features is a criminal. And of course, not all criminals have them. So that uh, rather disproves his theory. And uh, the criminologist Charles Goering used a non-criminal control group and found no significant differences in the terms of behaviour. So that links through to my first weakness that he didn't have a control group. Had he had one, he would have found that his um, theory made didn't have any credence to it. And of course, his theory is extremely deterministic. It's the idea that once you're born criminal, you can't escape it. There's nothing you can do to save the criminal. So it assumes we can't escape our destiny. And also, to some extent, is physiological theory. It ignores the effects of upbringing, environment, this idea of nature, nurture. He's much more onto nature and very little on nurture. You could argue that crime running in families could often be down, down to the learning from parents, not inherited factors of the fact that you learn by watching your parents do it. It's got nothing to do with your biology whatsoever. So those are the weaknesses. So pretty straightforward, the strengths and weaknesses of Lombroso there. So that lends, leads us on to AC 4.1, which looks at how Lombroso's theories have informed policy development. Now, the reality is they haven't very much at all because the theory is not given much weight. However, there are some ways that policy development has been informed by some parts of the theory. So this assessment component is looking at the ways in which theories about criminality have influenced and shaped different crime control policies, the ways that governments have gone about trying to prevent or control crime. So Lombroso's inference, inference is much more, speci uh, much more general than specific when it comes to policy development. But as I stated previously, the emergence of offender profiling and the use of offender profiling 
is a policy that's used by numerous police forces around the world. So it has an influence on that. It's informed that idea that one needs to get a whole picture of the offender. And I suppose with all biological theories to some extent, you could argue if like on Lombroso, you think criminals are born that way, that's going to influence your policy around the death penalty. Because what you're saying is you can't rehabilitate criminals because they're biologically predisposed to behave in that way. So you could quite crassly argue there's little point in trying to re rehabilitate them as the cause of the criminal is biological, better to save money and kill them, use the death penalty. So, to sum up, whilst his theory isn't taken seriously in today's society, he was the first person to give criminology scientific credibility. He moved thinking away from the fact that crime was merely moral and a religious issue, and he paved the way for other researchers who put forward more scientifically accepted biological theories for criminality. So that, folks, is Lombroso. You've got his theory. Remember those key phrases, atavistic. Have some um, examples of the different types of criminal and the different types of atavistic feature that Lombroso thought uh, they had. Know the strengths and weaknesses and have a vague idea of how some of that theory may have informed policy such as offender profiling and attitudes to the death penalty. I hope you found that useful. Goodbye.